When it comes to displaying a data set, I mostly see two extremes. Some people always use the same type of graph in every situation because it's the type that everyone around them uses all the time. For example, this one in the life sciences. Some people, in contrast, just pick one of the many options offered by their software application, either at random or for the sake of originality. In neither case are people thinking which graph would be most effective in their situation. In this mini-lecture, I propose we take a look at how to choose the right graph, that is, the most effective type of graph. Effective for what, you might ask? Our assumption is that graphs are meant to reveal something about the data. Accordingly, we must ask two questions. First, what data am I trying to reveal something about? And this question is not about the number of data, which is largely irrelevant. It's about the structure of the data set. That is, how many variables and what kind of variables, continuous or discrete. A continuous variable, such as time, pressure or temperature, can conceptually take any numerical value within the range so in a graph, it corresponds to a scale, an axis. A discrete variable can only take a finite, typically small set of values and will therefore divide the data set into subsets. A biologist may want to look separately at data for males and for females. A sociologist at data for families with low, medium and high income and so on. So first question, what is the structure of my data set? Next question, what am I trying to reveal about these data? Or you could organize the answer into as many categories as you want, but in 25 years of helping people make better graphs, I found that just four categories are most helpful. Comparison, evolution, correlation, and distribution. And if you have one or more discrete variables, then you might consider subsets as a fifth category, as you are trying to compare comparisons, compare evolutions, compare correlations, and compare distributions. For the next 12 minutes or so, let's discuss each of the four categories in turn, starting with comparison, and at the end, we will consider subsets. The whole idea of a graph is to represent numbers by a geometric property proportional to these numbers. If you compare parts of a whole in a pie chart, for example, the area of each segment is proportional to the fraction of that part in the whole, the percentage, if you prefer. Unfortunately, the human eyes and brains are not very good at comparing areas. It's not the best geometric property. Fortunately, in a pie chart, the angle of each segment at the center is also proportional to the segment's value, and that's detected a little more accurately by humans, assuming the graph does show the angles, of course. Donuts are not as good as pies in this respect. More accurate than angles, simpler than angles too, is length in one dimension, as in this divided bar, or better still, length aligned at one end as in this bar graph, usually the best option for comparison. Simple, intuitive, accurate. Now, you also want it readable? Well, remove the colors, which are meaningless here, and rotate the graph 90 degrees, so the text labels are horizontal, and so the numbers to be compared are nicely under each other. Such a graph with horizontal bars combines nicely with tabular information. Here, for example, we can add a column of absolute values and even sum it up. Unless the labels have a natural sequence, one last change we can do is order the values from largest to smallest. It helps answer typical questions such as which is the largest, but especially it brings next to each other the bars that are closest in length, making them all the easier to compare visually. Because the length must be proportional to the data, the bars must necessarily start from zero. 
That's fine for very different values, such as the population of Belgium and neighboring countries. But it can be disappointing for very similar values, such as life expectancy in the same countries. Here, bars of similar lengths give a correct picture of the data, which are similar, but we might still be interested in the differences, however small. Can we zoom on these differences then? Yes, but not with the length representation, because it would suggest incorrect proportions. Instead, we can use a position representation with dots instead of bars. You might argue that this graph is as much about distribution within a given interval as it is about comparison, and yes, it's a multifunctional graph. Now that we have replaced bars by dots, we might question why each dot is occupying a separate line. For a more compact graph, go from two to one dimension by projecting all the dots down on the axis or next to it. Again, we may want to rotate this one-dimensional graph to be able to place the text labels horizontally. Such a one-dimensional graph is a simple and powerful way to show a single variable. You do see here it's one weakness, data with the same value coalesce after projection, but you can find graphical solutions such as multiple labels. A simple bar graph works great for comparison, especially with values arranged from largest to smallest, but it does not work well for revealing an evolution. And this is our second category. When each bar corresponds to a value you can place on an axis, then one variable of interest is the rate of change, that is, the slope. If you want to show slope in addition to values, then replace the bars by dots and connect the dots with a line. And if it's clear where the data points are, you need not even show them explicitly, just draw the line. Beware, however, when the bars correspond to values that are not equally spaced, they suggest incorrect slopes. Always position the dots correctly along the axis of your independent variable, whether it's time, concentration or order, and connect the dots. This time, do show the data points explicitly, otherwise your graph may be misleading. Lines do not just show the slope, they also outperform the messy multi-bar graphs in which you cannot easily single out one set of trees out of the forest. Replace bars by lines and you see three clearly distinguishable trends. One word of caution, however, with multi-line graphs. If two lines correspond to two different vertical scales, you are visually comparing things that are not comparable. Here, for example, the two lines cross, whereas the data never do. One set stops at 10, the other one starts at 20. Same here. Now the numerical values are the same, but the units are not. You are creating visual nonsense. If the different lines are expressed in the same units, show them on the same scale, so the comparison is meaningful. Crossing lines mean equal values. If the different lines are expressed in different units, but evolve as a function of the same independent variable, then put them on top of each other, in a sense, but in separate panels on the page, not overlaid. And you can easily see coincidences across panels. Let's get back for a second to multibar graphs. In this one, the numbers just correspond to independent items in a sample, for example, mouse number one, mouse number two, and so on. In a random sample, this numbering is meaningless. Mouse seven could as well have been mouse 13. If we renumber our sample, we get a very different picture, even though the data set is the same, which means that the chosen representation is basically meaningless. When we had only one set of bars, we solved the issue by ordering the values from largest to smallest. Well, can't do that with two sets of values, such as here. One specific case can be solved with connected dots. If one bar is, say, before treatment and the other after treatment, 
We could regard each pair of bars as an evolution in the sense that we would like to compare the rates of change. Here goes. Do you see how we basically have here two one-dimensional graphs next to each other on the same scale and we connect the dots? You see how we can much more easily spot the outlier? Now, what if the two sets of bars are not a before after? What if one is the concentration of compound X and the other the concentration of compound Y? Connected dots would not make much sense. Instead of an evolution, we can reveal a correlation, and that is our third category. Let's start again for more two one-dimensional graphs. When they represented the same variable at different times, we drew them parallel on the same scale. When they represent independent variables, we can draw them perpendicular, orthogonal, and then plot a dot at the intersection of the two values for each item in our sample. We have a scatter plot. And you probably know scatter plots to reveal correlations, but they can show much more than that for two variables. If we'd like to know whether we have more y than x in our items, we could add the diagonal on our scatter plot. Oh look, we do have more y than x, except at low concentrations. Again, we readily spot the outlier, and we could keep the two one-dimensional graphs to show the distribution of each of the two variables. All that is nice and good for two variables, but what do you do when you have measured three variables across your sample? Some people draw three-dimensional scatter plots, but these only make sense if you can see them in three dimensions. When you work in only two dimensions, you can take the variables two by two. You draw three two-dimensional scatter plots and organize them into a matrix. Here, the top left panel shows mathematics versus writing, the bottom left panel shows critical reading versus writing, and the bottom right panel shows critical reading versus mathematics. Obviously, you can extend the matrix for four, five, or even more variables. As we said, one-dimensional graphs and scatter plots give us a good idea of data distribution as well, but let's discuss distribution explicitly as a last category. Variability is a key component of experimental research, yet it is often shown poorly, if not hidden, in graphs. At best, researchers summarize variability in one number, such as standard deviation, standard error of the mean or confidence interval, which they show with whiskers around a dot representing the mean. Many graphs don't even clarify which parameter is thus shown. What's the problem with this? Well, a summary hides a lot of potentially useful information about the distribution of the data. Look at these four very different data distributions. All four of them have the same mean and the same standard deviation. See how much information we lose by summarizing the distribution with just two numbers here? To state the obvious, the best way to show the data is to show the data. Whenever possible, and it's often possible in my experience, show all the data. You can add a mean, of course, or a median, or whatever else is useful to you. If you are going to summarize nonetheless, then consider a richer summary, such as a box plot. This is not an intuitive type of graph. It requires a definition and some getting used to, but it gives a different picture for each of our four data sets. That's at least something. But again, if you can, don't hide anything, show all your data. In a nutshell, then, use bars or dots to allow comparisons, connect the dots with lines to reveal slopes in evolutions, make two-dimensional scatter plots for comparisons or correlations among several variables, no matter how many you have, and use one-dimensional graphs to display distribution if you can, summarize only if you have to. 
That's pretty much all for continuous variables. If you divide your data set into subsets with discrete variables, then you just do the same, but you do it several times. Fundamentally, you have two options to do so. Either you show the subsets in a single panel, or you show them in different panels at the same scale. A single panel allows an easier comparison, but when it gets crowded, multiple panels are neater. The main advantage of having two options to display subsets is really the possibility to represent two discrete variables, one as subsets within each panel, the other as subsets across panels. And by having multiple panels both horizontally and vertically, you could even encode a third discrete variable in your display. You can thus build fairly complex displays that remain readable. Keep it in mind the next time you must choose the right graph.